So for this lecture, uh, we're moving on to the next major domain, which is the eukaryotes or the eukarya. So if you remember, there's three d major domains, the bacteria, the archaea, and the eukarya. And when I say domains, I'm talking about the largest uh, taxonomic group. So domains is even above kingdoms. Um, in last uh, few lectures, we've been talking about the prokaryotes, the bacteria and the archaea. And now we're going to talk about this domain, the eukarya. We're going to talk about what they are, some of the traits that they have that are unique to them, uh, that make them successful. We're going to discuss when they first appeared. Um, and we're also going to discuss how they evolved over the next few lectures. So when you think of eukaryotes, um, what people typically think of, or what you hopefully are thinking of, are fungi, animals, plants, these sort of charismatic uh, multicellular organisms. Um, these are sort of typical examples of eukaryotes. Um, however, there are also unicellular eukaryotic organisms, things like an amoeba or a dinoflagellate or a diatom, these sort of unicellular microscopic organisms are also eukaryotic organisms. Um, and typically, I think when we think of like tiny microscopic unicellular organisms, we think of the prokaryotes, bacteria and archaea, but there are eukaryotic organisms that are small like this too, which gives rise to the question of what makes something a eukaryote? So what are the unique traits that make something eukaryotic if it's not just multicellularity? So I'm gonna spend a little bit of time just talking about the traits that are unique to eukaryotes, um, starting with the diverse morphology. So eukaryotes are very diverse in their appearance. They can be anything from uni to multicellular organisms. So unicellular organisms like these things called dinoflagellates and amoebas all the way up to some of the largest organisms or the largest organisms that we can think of on planet Earth, whether you're talking about a redwood tree or a Tyrannosaurus rex. All of these multicellular organisms are eukaryotes. And as you can see, eukaryotes are very, very divorce, or diverse in their uh, appearance or their morphology. And I just want to point out that the reason multicellular is underlined and has a little asterisk next to it is because multicellularity is a trait that is unique to eukaryotes. So eukaryotes are the only truly multicellular organisms that are out there, or the, the only group or domain of organisms that are truly multicellular. So bacteria and archaea, the prokaryotes, are not multicellular. Um, eukaryotes are also very diverse in the ways that they reproduce. Um, so they can reproduce asexually through mitosis. So they're basically using the process of mitosis or cellular reproduction to reproduce copies of themselves. Like you see in this budding yeast, this is an example of asexual reproduction through mitosis. And so remember when you do mitosis, if you can remember back to high school um, or even bio 140, when you're doing mitotic reproduction, you're making an exact genetic copy of your chromosomes. And this yeast, so remember yeast is a fungus, and fungi are examples of eukaryotes, reproduce mitotically, asexually, by budding off and just making an exact genetic replica of itself. However, eukaryotes can also reproduce sexually by meiosis. And meiosis and sexual reproduction are unique to the eukaryotes. So sexual reproduction is unique to eukaryotes. Only eukaryotes reproduce sexually by meiosis. And if you remember, when you reproduce by meiosis, if you produce copies of cells through meiosis, those copies of cells are different genetically from the parent cells that produce them in that they go from a diploid cell to a haploid cell. In other words, the number of chromosomes gets cut in half. And so I'm not gonna get into all the details of how that works and what that means. Just understand that meiosis because it cuts the number or copies of chromosomes in half, meiosis is a necessary uh, uh, process for sexual reproduction to occur. And so typically we think of meiosis producing sperm and egg cells and sperm and egg come together and that's sort of like sexual reproduction and fertilization. Um, but beyond just the sperm and egg, which is actually something that animals, that's the way animals sexually reproduce, there are also a lot of other types of sexual reproductive cycles that we see in eukaryotes where you don't just have egg and sperm you can have other types of haploid and diploid cells and so i don't expect you at this point to learn or memorize all of the sort of details of what's going on in these things that are called life cycles other than to understand that there's lots of different types of life cycles that have evolved in eukaryotic organisms but in all of these life cycles 
no matter what sort of life stages animals go through. You have 1N or haploid uh, life stages, and you have 2N or diploid life stages that can be uni or multicellular life stages. And so that is to say that there's lots of different ways sexual uh, reproduction can work beyond just a sperm and an egg. But all of these forms of sexual reproduction require haploid cells being made by meiosis. So they require meiosis and they require the haploid or the, the cellular chromosome number to be cut in half. So what else, what other traits are unique to the eukaryotes? Eukaryotes also have membrane-bound DNA that's in a nucleus, so it's in a nuclear membrane, and they have organelles that are wrapped up in membranes too. So an example of organelles would be mitochondria, or chloroplasts, or vacuoles, or ribosomes. So those are all examples of organelles that are unique to eukaryotes. So only eukaryotes have their DNA bound in a membrane, so they only eukaryotes have a nucleus, and only eukaryotes have organelles. Whereas prokaryotes do not have any of those traits. And on top of that, in general, eukaryotes tend to have a much larger cell size relative to the prokaryotes. So just looking at the typical relative size of a eukaryotic cell versus a prokaryotic cell. And it can even be much bigger than this and much smaller than this, okay? But in general, eukaryotes tend to be larger in size um, or their cells tend to be larger than prokaryotic cells. Another unique trait to the eukaryotes um, and a thing that all eukaryotes have in common is they have linear chromosomes um, and those chromosomes are held in a nucleus. So if you look at chromosomes, so this is the typical chromosome count of humans. So if you've ever heard of 23andMe, the reason they call it 23andMe is because humans have 23 chromosomes. That's 22 normal chromosomes and then a set of sex chromosomes. And if you take each of these chromosomes, they come in pairs. So you have two pair or a pair of chromosome number one, a pair of chromosome number two, a pair of chromosome number three. If you take any one of those individual chromosomes, and this is what it looks like if you sort of zoom in on it and then begin to try to unfurl it. What you can see is that the DNA is actually linear DNA that's tightly woven around these histones. Those histones are further tightly woven um, and compacted around each other, and that's even further compacted down until you get to these highly condensed chromosomes. And so when you look at the chromosomes, it's actually a bunch of super highly condensed, tightly wound DNA all wrapped around these green sort of histone proteins. And so chromosomes are really tightly, tightly packed um, linear sections or linear strands of DNA. They're all woven around each other. And this is a trait it's unique to eukaryotes and actually very important for organizing their DNA and their genomes. Other traits that are unique to the eukaryotes are what they have in common. Um, they have very limited metabolic diversity. So their metabolic diversity, um, eukaryotes do not have any unique metabolic systems or metabolic types that are unique to only the eukaryotes. So remember prokaryotes um, they're very diverse in the types of metabolisms that they can do. They can do every sort of type of metabolism that's out there that we know about, whereas eukaryotes are really limited, where most being like 99.999999% of eukaryotes are either photoautotrophs or chemoheterotrophs. The chemoheterotrophs do aerobic cellular respiration. So that's what's going on in their mitochondria. They're doing cellular respiration. They can also do a little bit of fermentation, but mostly rely on aerobic cellular respiration. There's also uh, photoautotrophs. So if they have chloroplasts, and it's not just plants, they're not the only eukaryotes that have chloroplasts, but plants are eukaryotes. They do have chloroplasts, and they do oxygenic photosynthesis, so they can be photoautotrophic. Um, and they also do cellular respiration. So plants also have mitochondria and they'll also do aerobic cellular respiration. But on top of that, they can do oxygenic photosynthesis so they can be photoautotrophs. Um, there are a few, very, very few, very, very, very few rare eukaryotes that can do anaerobic cellular respiration and photoheterotrophy. But these are usually, um, these are extremely rare in the eukaryotes and they usually just supplement aerobic cellular respiration, fermentation, these other metabolic processes. They don't do these independently. 
um, and there are none to our knowledge, no examples of eukaryotes that can do chemoautotropy or anoxygenic photosynthesis. Um, so they're relatively limited in their metabolic diversity. But despite those limitations, eukaryotes have been very, very successful um, in terms of their ability to adapt to a lot of different environments, whether they're coral reefs that are eukaryotic organisms at sea, whether they're a lion and a wildebeest that have evolved on land, or the grass that they're running on, or the animals that we see in the air, things like insects, things like eagles. And so we see huge diversity um, of eukaryotes despite their metabolic limitations. And in fact, of the 1.8 million described species that we know of on planet Earth, so the 1.8 million that have been described, like formally described and in detail described, most of them are eukaryotes. And so you can see, for example, about 50% represented by these blue things on this phylogenetic tree here that also represents a sort of pie chart of how many species. So all these tips represent different species. 50% are animals. This percentage here represents fungi. This percentage here represents plants. And then in the red, we have the archaea and the bacteria. And so most of the described organisms that we know are actually eukaryotic organisms. And that just goes to show that, that there are a lot of species of eukaryotes, and they've been very successful despite these sort of metabolic limitations that they have might, might have compared to the prokaryotes. Um, but that's also, you know, this could be really a bias in what we're able to describe because most of the species we described are the ones we can easily see with our eyes. And the archaea and the bacteria, because they're microscopic, it makes it much more difficult for us to describe those species. And that could be one reason that this sort of dominance of the eukaryotic organisms and the number of species we described is, um, yeah, dominated by multicellular organisms. So what contributes to eukaryote success? Why do we see them um, in so many places? Um, so let's talk about a couple different characteristics that are uni unique to eukaryotes that contributes to their success and ability to survive in so many different habitats. One is their larger cell size, and I'll talk about some of the advantages and disadvantages of having this larger cell size. Um, two is the fact they have organelles, and this allows them to compartmentalize different cellular processes, which is helps aid in the efficiency of these cells to can do these different metabolic processes. Um, the third thing is that they have their nucleus packed, they have a nucleus and they have their DNA packed into linear DNA and this type of genomic organization is really important for the success of these organisms and their ability to express different traits. They have a cytoskeleton and an inner membrane system. Um, these basically internally organize each cell of eukaryotic organisms, whether unicellular or multicellular, they all have cytoskeletons and these inner cell membrane systems that can be really helpful for organizing cellular level processes. We'll talk about sexual reproduction, which is a unique trait to the eukaryotes. Um, and once again, every one of these traits that I've listed here are unique traits to the eukaryotes. Sexual reproduction is very important for introducing... Um, variation, genetic variation into the population and therefore phenotypic variation and, and supplying the variation needed for natural selection to pick from, pick from and choose from. We'll also talk about the importance of multicellularity um, and how that's evolved in eukaryotes. So first I want to talk about this idea of larger cell size. So why does size matter? So if you think about a eukaryotic cell pictured here versus a prokaryotic cell pictured here, and this is probably not as accurate as it could be in the sense that the prokaryotic cell should probably be even smaller on this diagram. I wanna talk about what are the benefits of being a larger cell. So why is it advantageous for a eukaryotic cell to be larger? And not just what's the advantage of being larger for an individual cell, but also what are the advantages of being larger for an organism in general? So with eukaryotic organisms, because they can be multicellular and built up of many different cooperating cells, uh, eukaryotic organisms in general, the multicellular ones can be very large too in comparison to prokaryotic cells. So I wanna talk about the benefits of being a larger cell, the benefits of also being a larger, larger organism in general, as well as the costs of being a larger cell and the costs of being a larger organism in general. So when we talk about a larger cell, 
one big benefit of being larger is now it can fit all of these different organelles, a nucleus, um, and all of these sort of different, yeah, different types of organelles that give the cell an advantage in the sense that they allow it to process nutrients and organize cellular processes in a more efficient and compartmentalized way. And I'll get into the details of that a little bit more to explain exactly what I mean by that. But there are huge benefits to having an organelles, a nucleus. And in addition to that, being a larger cell in general, some cells are able to eat other cells through this process called phagocytosis, where they essentially act like a giant blob and engulf smaller cells. And that ability to eat and engulf larger cells is advantageous for obvious reasons. You can get better nutrients and things like that by eating other cellular organisms. Cells also, um, or a cost of this though, is that cells now need adaptations to get nutrients into and waste out of each cell. Um, and so basically if you're a larger cell, it's a larger distance from the inside of the cell to the outside of the cell. And so you need special adaptations to get wastes out of the cell and to get nutrients into the cell. Um, basically, you need sort of conveyor belts to move things around because just letting things move around on their own is not enough. And when I say things moving around on their own, what I mean is the process of diffusion. So simple diffusion is not enough. If you don't remember diffusion or can't recall anything about a diffusion, please look this up in your textbook and review it. But essentially, all the diffusion is is just the random movement of molecules in a medium. So the same way if you fart in a room and those fart gas particles fill up the room and spread out into the room, that is your fart diffusing out through the room. Okay? So that is the process of diffusion. It's just the natural sort of movement and spread of molecules through some sort of medium, whether it's air or water or the inner uh, sort of cytosol of a cell. If we look at the organismal scale, there's a wide variety of fitness related adaptations to being larger and you can think about a T-Rex, the huge advantage that it has by being much larger in, in order to capture and eat other prey, or the advantages of say a Brontosaurus for being really large and being able to eat food off the top of trees or being so big that it can sort of beat off a, a Tyrannosaurus from eating it. Um, and so there's a lot of at uh, sort of adaptate or advantages to being a large organism. However, it can also be very costly to be a large organism, specifically because you need adaptations to get nutrients, wastes, and heat into and out of your body. And so if you're a really large organism, you need a way to get sort of food and nutrients and air and gas, so oxygen and CO2, into and out of your body. And so for example, humans have evolved all these very elaborate systems, whether it's a gut, whether it's a circulatory system, whether it's your lungs, all these things are interconnected ways to make sure that nutrients and uh, gases can get into and out of your body really easily. And one really important component of this is the influence of size on surface area to volume ratios. So when I'm talking about surface area to volume ratios, what I'm talking about is the ratio of the surface area that's exposed to the outer environment relative to the volume of the sort of liquids that fill up an, or an organism, a cell, or any shape in general, okay? So for example, if we're looking at a eukaryotic cell over here and a prokaryotic cell over here, when we're talking about the volume of this cell, what we're sort of talking about here are the parts of the cell that are not directly exposed to the environment. So it has this cellular membrane all around it, or if you're a prokaryote, you have a cell membrane, a cell wall all around it, and that's the part of the cell that's exposed directly to the environment. And the volume is all the sort of liquid stuff that's on the inside of that cell that's not directly exposed to the environment. And the volume dictates the energy needs and waste production of any one of these cells. So the more volume you have, the more energy, usually in the cellular form of ATP, you need, and the more waste you're going to generate. So this larger eukaryotic cell has a much larger volume, and it's gonna need a lot more energy to survive and sort of do the things that the cell needs to do to survive, and it's gonna produce a lot more waste in that process than this prokaryotic cell. 
And when you think about the energy and nutrients that it needs and the waste that it's producing to sort of perform all the sort of cellular processes that a cell needs to do to survive, all of that stuff has to move into and out of the cell through the surface area or the part of the cell that's directly touching or connected to the outside environment that's not part of the cell. So waste got to get out through that surface area that's connected to the external environment and nutrients have to get in through that surface area that's connected to the external environment. When we're talking about a cell, an individual cell, that surface area is really the cell membrane or in the case of the prokaryote you have a cell membrane and a cell wall. So this is the and if we're talking about a multicellular organism or some shape like that, so let's pretend this is not a cell, but this is like a multicellular egg or something like that instead of a cell. What we're talking about is the shell of the egg. That's the part of it that's exposed to the outside environment. Or if you're talking about a multicellular human being, you're talking about your skin. That's the part that's exposed to the outside environment. And in all those cases, that is the surface area. It's the area of the organism that's on the surface that's exposed to the outside environment. Um, and we need to think about the idea here that if you're a larger cell or a larger organism and you have a larger volume, it means it's a longer distance to get from the center of that volume all the way to the outside or surface area. And that's important um, when we think about this idea of wastes moving out and nutrients moving in. So if nutrients move into the cell, they've got to get to every part of that cell um, and have to make it from the outside into the middle. And same deal with wastes. If wastes are produced in the center of that cell, they have to move a further distance to get out to the outside. And as it turns out, as cell size increases, the volume of that cell actually increases at a much, much faster rate than the surface area. So your volume is your length times your width times your height if you're thinking about a cube. So it's your it's a cubic, what's called the cubic function because it's raised to the power of three. Every time something gets bigger, it grows to the power of three. Whereas your surface area is typically just a length times width thing. It's sort of your flat surface area, okay? And with a surface area, it grows, it grows in a, a squared function as opposed to a cubic function. So the power of two instead of the power of three. So what that means is, essentially, as you get bigger and bigger and bigger, your surface area is going to grow at a slower rate than your volume is. And so this volume number is going to get bigger than the surface area number, such that this ratio, if you take the surface area divided by the volume, as these two things increase and something gets bigger, the ratio actually goes down. In other words, there's less of total cell organism or it's total cell or the organism is in direct contact with the outside environment. So as you get bigger and bigger and bigger, less of your volume is directly exposed to the volume, uh, the outside area relative to your surface area. So that is to say smaller cells like prokaryotic cells have a higher surface area to volume ratio than larger cells. So bigger organisms, even though they have a larger total surface area, the amount of surface area relative to the volume is actually lower. So smaller has a higher surface area to volume ratio, bigger has a lower surface area to volume ratio. And this is important not only for the movement of nutrients and wastes into and out of a cell or into and out of an organism, it's also really important for heat exchange and thermoregulation. So it's very important for organisms to keep at a, in, uh, the right temperature. And so it's harder uh, for heat to move into and out of, or it moves at a slower rate into and out of um, a larger cell than it does a smaller cell. So prokaryotes are going to heat up and cool down much more quickly because they have a higher surface area to volume ratio, whereas larger cells or larger organisms are going to heat up and cool down much more slowly because they're exchanging less heat relative to their total volume. And so that heat, for example, will get retained in the volume. It'll take longer to sweep the whole way out of that organism because it has a lower total surface area relative to its volume. Okay, so all that stuff was maybe just a little bit confusing to you. And so 
what I've done is prepared this activity. It's a surface area to volume ratio quiz, where essentially you're looking at a set of cube and rectangular shaped organisms, so to speak, where this cube is either going to represent a cell or this cube represents a multicellular organism of different sizes. And you're going to figure out what happens to the surface area to volume of these sort of hypothetical cubic and square and rectangular shaped organisms as they change size and shape. And so for this Canvas quiz, please submit it one per student by the deadline that's posted on Canvas. Feel free to work with others or get help during lecture time. And please make sure it's submitted by the deadline that's posted, which is before the next lecture. Okay. Thanks, guys. Bye.